Good morning. We welcome you to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We also welcome Rev. Lloyd Eyre, retired pastor of the Free Methodist Church in Peterborough, who will be our speaker this morning. Please join us in worship and the Word on this Lord's Day, February 28, 2021. Andrew Harbridge leads our worship. Sylvie Copland plays and sings the children's song with her husband, Malcolm Copland, who puts the service online each week. Sylvie is also our reader this morning. My wife, Diane, tells the children's story. She and I are enjoying our final week of holidays, but we have recorded our contributions early. I'm Pastor David Richardson. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. Let us pray. Thank you, our Father, that we can be in your presence. We ask you for this attitude that we too may put our hope in your word and our expectation in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Park Street Baptist Church, and a special warm welcome to our guest speaker, Rev. Lloyd Eyre. Let's now begin worshiping the Lord by singing our first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. The first reading is Psalm 22, verses 1 to 5. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. This is the Word of God. Some of you may have noticed that I um, try to include a variety of music in every service. Uh, and I try to follow this um, plan, an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob <laughs> sort of uh, plan. And, and with uh, Abraham being the oldest type of music, and I see uh, the Isaac being the gospel favorites, and the Jacob being the new contemporary music. 
So I know uh, you can't please everybody all the time, but I do hope that everyone finds something that they really do like in every service. And now let's sing the gospel favorite, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves me and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask Him, He will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly and tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and He will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. The second reading is Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. 
Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of God. For our contemporary hymns this morning, we've got 10,000 reasons, and here I am to worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. to see. 
step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy. Together, wonderful to me. Good morning, kids. It's now song time and story time just for you. Sylvia and Malcolm. Good morning, children. We just sang, He is able, He is able, I know He is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. What does that mean? In Romans 11, 
Paul tells us that God is able. He can do anything. The song goes, He heals the brokenhearted, and he sets the captive free. He makes the lame to walk again, and he causes the blind to see. You know from Bible stories that Jesus healed people. If they were blind or deaf or couldn't walk or had a bad disease, he made them whole. They were all better. We also know that different times in the Bible, God opened the prison gates to free the disciples. And even today, God does free people by a miracle from prison. They are there because they love God and are telling other people. God frees them to carry on their work. We also know that God heals people's minds. If broken-hearted or very sad, God gives comfort, and if very afraid, he gives peace. God even made storms to go away and strong winds to calm down. God can help no matter what you need. Just be sure that you are obeying God and trusting him. Even us grown-ups can tell of times that God carried us through troubles and even healed some of us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you are able. You are able to do anything. You know what we are thinking and feeling, but you want us to talk to you and to trust you to take care of us. Help the children, in fact all of us, to talk to you and trust you to take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Andrew, Malcolm and Sylvie, and Diane. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in prayer by your grace. We know that we could not stand in your presence except that Jesus has died for us as a sacrificial lamb to atone for our sins. We thank you that he came to this earth for that purpose. We confess to you our sins. We cannot make it through a week or through a day without sinning. Yet you graciously forgive us in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for any who may have ongoing sin in their lives, a particular sin that they have not confessed, have not repented of. Thank you that you wait graciously for them. We ask that you would get their attention so that they would turn back to you before their hearts grow cold. We pray for family and friends who have never known you. Help us to know our place in reaching them with the gospel. We ask for ourselves that we would spend the time we need in your presence, in the study of your word and in prayer, in obedience to what we know to do. We ask for physical healing. You know those among us who are suffering a great deal. Keep us safe from the virus, we pray. We ask for emotional healing that we might serve you better. Help us to fix our eyes on you and learn the lessons you have for us. We bring before you our speaker, Rev. Lloyd Eyre. We ask that you would use his ministry to us to encourage our faithfulness. We pray that you would bless him in his current ministries, that you would use him to advance the gospel of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Welcome to Park Street Baptist Church. Uh, I'm here with Pastor Richardson. Uh, My name is Lloyd Eyre, and uh, it's a privilege to be here. I wish you were here too, Uh, but uh, because of what uh, is taking place in our world today, uh, obviously that isn't an option. Uh, We're taping on uh, Ash Wednesday, the 17th day of February for Sunday, February the 28th, and uh, it's appropriate that the message that I have today is an Ash Wednesday uh, type theme. It's, it's Gethsemane, but of course it's uh, the season of Lent now having begun. And it's during this season of Lent that uh, the church is historically focused on the cross. And so uh, the events of, of the cross and uh, the week leading up, Passion Week, uh, of course include Gethsemane. And it is from Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 to 46 that I will speak this morning and that I will read uh, from the New International Version. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men walk, keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may the events that took place so many centuries ago be real to us today. And may the lessons that you would have us learn from this event in your life, in the closing hours of your life, may they... Uh, have meaning and application to our lives as we live in these very difficult days. In Jesus' name, amen. From my earliest days in public school until today, I have been fascinated by words and language. I endured the math and science classes in high school, but the English and history classes I loved. I'm particularly interested in the meaning of words, phrase, and figures of speech that are unique to the English language. Our daughter Catherine is a grade seven language arts teacher at Prairie Middle School in Denver, Colorado. In her school of 1800 grade six, seven, and eight students are 50 language groups. Imagine teaching English in a school that has a student body of 1,800 and 15, uh, 50 language groups as well. So imagine that you're an immigrant, refugee, attempting to learn English. I've got some words for you today. How about window pane? Beautiful window panes in Park Street Baptist Church. P-A-N-E, but I am in pain sounds the very same, spelt differently, and it means something very different as well. Or <clears throat> referring to something done well, we often say, he hit it out of the park. Well, we refer to a home run. It's the best you can possibly do in the game of baseball, but I explain that to someone that's learning English as a second language as well, that's never seen a baseball game. Or here's another, asleep at the switch. What am I referring to? Is it a light switch? No. This figure of speech would be incredibly difficult to teach because I'm guessing that most of us listening to this message today don't even know the origin of this phrase ourselves, let alone an immigrant. But I know the meaning of this phrase because from 1962 to 1964, I lived in the hamlet of Haley Station, Ontario, when I was seven to nine years of age. 59 years ago this summer, Donald and Alice Eyre and their five children moved to the little dot on the map located between Renfrew and Cobden in the Ottawa Valley called Haley Station. Dad had been appointed to the pastoral charge, Free Methodist Church in Renfrew and Haley Station. I was seven, my youngest sister Carol was six months old, and there were three more kids, Paul, Ruth, and Marcia, in between. The old parsonage was wedged, literally wedged, between old highway number 17 and the main line of the Canadian Pacific Railroad, which went to Sudbury and then to Winnipeg and points west. 
To the east of the house, about 100 feet away, was Highway 17. To the west, about 75 feet away, was the train tracks. The only thing between our house, five children from age seven to six months, and the CPR line was my mother's garden. You always knew when the train was coming. About one mile away, the dishes in the cupboard began to rattle. By the time you could see the train, the house was shaking. And in the middle of the night, you were sure the train was going to come right through the house. Haley Station was a station. There was a railroad yard with several parallel railway tracks. Now for the origin of a sleep at the switch. I can remember the railway man putting a long iron rod into the switch that allowed the great CPR train to continue its way west at what seemed to a young boy to be 60 miles per hour. And that's where a sleep at the switch finds its origin. It refers to the railway man being asleep and failing to switch the tracks for the train to run on the right track. Can you imagine what would have happened if that railway man had been asleep at the switch? If that train had ever derailed in Haley Station, our house would have been flattened. There's no doubt about it. A massive derailment would probably have resulted in loss of life. But what I want you to see today is that on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus' three closest friends were asleep at the switch. On the night of Jesus' passion, which is what we call the time that given to, what we call the term given to his mortal agony, Peter, James, and John slept right through it. They were asleep at the switch. And this has caused me to ask the question, is it possible that I too could be asleep at the switch? Three sleep sessions that take place in Matthew chapter 26. I'd like to look at each of these three separately, individually, as we walk through this passage of scripture. Sleep session number one, Matthew 26, verses 36 to 41. Right on the heels of the first celebration of the Lord's Supper, Jesus and his disciples moved from the city of Jerusalem to a garden on the Mount of Olives, just outside the city where Jesus habitually went to pray. Leaving nine of the disciples in the area of the garden, he took Peter, James, and John with him. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God, very man of very man, began to pour out his soul to those three friends. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me, verse 38 reads. Jesus moves on a little farther and falls with his face to the ground and prays, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Here the Son of God pours out his soul to God his Father, pleading that the cup be removed, but affirming that God's will be done in his life. Here the salvation of the world is hinging on the response of Jesus to this crisis, hanging in the balance. Here he is pleading his case before God. What are those three friends doing? They're asleep. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. <clears throat> so being interpreted, Jesus is really saying, even if you cannot pray for me, you need to pray for yourselves because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, that takes us to sleep session number two. Feeling the enormity of his calling, Jesus moves away from the three disciples a second time. Now notice the progression in this second prayer that Jesus utters to his father. In the first instance, he asks if the cup could be removed from him, but <clears throat> now he's changed. My father, if it is not possible, he assumes that the cup is going to have to be his and it cannot be removed from his life. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In this second prayer, Jesus does not ask for the cup to be taken away. He affirms his willingness to drink the cup in order for God's will to be done. The cross is now in view. Jesus is coming through this time. God is strengthening him as he accepts his cup. And where are his three prayer warriors? They are fast asleep. This time, the biblical record suggests that Jesus doesn't even waken them. So, sleep session number three. He leaves them and he prays the same prayer. Victory has been achieved in Jesus' life. For the final time, the cross is seen in Jesus' mind's eye and it has been accepted. The next day at this time, Jesus' body will be laid in the tomb. And for the third time, Jesus returns to his sleeping disciples. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The disciples slept right through Jesus' passion. They missed the whole thing. They did not hear those words of agony as Jesus pled for his life. They did not hear his progressive acceptance of the Father's will for his life. What's more, they were too tired to pray for the Savior as the salvation of the world, including theirs, hung in the balance. Do you see the contrast? Jesus struggling, praying, sweating great drops of blood Luke's passage, Luke's account, chapter 22, verse 44, gives us that extra bit of information. That the enormity of what he was feeling caused a physical response where he sweat great drops of blood. Here he is wrestling with the forces of nature, with the forces of darkness. And his disciples... Well, they're asleep at the switch. And I wonder about my life, and I wonder about all of our lives. Is it possible that while God was doing a great work in my life, in your life, in the life of this congregation, and in this community, in fact, in this world, at such a time as this. Is it possible that I could miss it? That I could be asleep at the switch? Is it possible that while a life-changing event is taking place right before my eyes, I could, I could be asleep only to be jolted awake when it's all over, when the derailment has taken place? How could it be possible? Well, how did it happen for the three disciples? Three reasons that I'd like to offer for you this morning. 
and three points of application that fit these three reasons. Reason number one, their physical weakness overpowered the spiritual priority of the hour. They were exhausted. They were exhausted physically. In fact, again, going to Luke's account of this event in verse 45 of Luke 22, he uses this beautiful phrase that they were exhausted from sorrow. I've been exhausted from sorrow, so have you. But the next night, they will have wished that they had not let their physical exhaustion rule them. For in so doing, they failed Jesus. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? How that sentence must have haunted them down the road of time. So I think it boils down to this question. Does my physical condition rule my spiritual priorities? Could I, could you miss something that God wants to do in your life because of overemphasis on the physical part of our humanity? I think Paul addresses this very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, when he, when he talks about the thorn in the flesh and, and his own physical limitations. This very, very significant sentence, no, he writes, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Their physical weakness overpowered the spiritual priority of the hour. Second, they failed to see the seriousness of the situation. Uh, imagine, they've been with Jesus for three years. Imagine, uh, when he began, like verse 37, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Verse 38, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Was Jesus just mouthing those words? No, they were real. He meant them. They thought that the Messiah was about to be crowned, but Jesus knew that the Messiah was about to be crucified. They missed what God was doing because they misread the signs along the way. Now, I think that can happen to us, too, very easily. That, that we get immersed in the situation in which we find ourselves. And because of that, we don't see the bigger picture. Uh, I, I guess one of the things, the images that I would use to kind of make my point here is, is, is that of a drone. I'm fascinated by these drones that I see, and real estate companies are using drones now to, to, to get above the property that's for sale and show you this, this global kind of perspective. I think we as Christians sometimes should take the view from the drone uh, to, to back away from what we're going through and just look above and then look down from above and, and, and try to stand back from the, the mire that we're in and, and say, okay, God, what's the big picture here? What are you doing? What, what's the global perspective? The disciples missed it. They were with Jesus. They were daily with him for three years, and yet they missed the big picture. They missed God's road signs along the way. That's the second reason why they were asleep at the switch. Here's the third they failed to realize that temptation was near for them. There was temptation for Jesus, for sure. They may not even have realized the enormity of the temptation that Jesus was experiencing as he wrestled with the forces of darkness. Imagine if he had not accepted the cup, we would obviously not be here today. There was temptation for Jesus, for sure. But what they failed to see was that temptation was just as near for them. And Jesus tells them that. 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And within three hours or less, Peter, asleep right now, will wish he had been praying because three times he will have denied ever knowing Jesus of Nazareth. Could we miss something that God wanted to do in our lives because we succumb to temptation and lost sight of the important things in life? My own personal experience is that the worst enemy of the first best in our lives is not the fifth best, it's the second best, because it looks so much like the first best. The disciples failed to realize that temptation was near for them. So on the one hand, we have Jesus struggling with God. We're in the middle of his passion, his mortal agony. On the other hand, His three closest friends are asleep. How could it have happened? Their physical weakness overpowered the spiritual priority. They failed to see the seriousness of the situation. They missed God's road signs. They failed to realize that temptation was near for them. The story of Gethsemane from the standpoint of the three disciples was that they were asleep at the switch. In my memory bank of more than 50 years ago, I can see that railway man coming from the station with the long iron rod and putting it into the switch. He actually did it manually. There was no technology back then. It was human power, uh, not uh, any kind of computer-generated switching mechanism. It was a long iron rod that he put into that switch that allowed the great CPR train to continue on its way west. The story of Gethsemane from the standpoint of the three disciples was that they were asleep at the switch. Wow. What would have happened if the railroad man had been asleep at the switch in Haley Station? Well, the disciples were asleep at the switch in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it isn't a good story as to what happened. The stakes are just as great for us in our spiritual lives. May God help us in the midst of the great events of our spiritual lives, which include going through a pandemic. May God help us not to miss what he is doing because we might be asleep at the switch. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, these are unusual, difficult times in which we live. And yet these times are completely known to you. You haven't been surprised by the events of 2020 and 2021 in this global village in which we live. And I am sure that you are speaking to this world and to your church during this season. May we, rather than wishing it would go away, although plainly we do, we want it to end, but we know that it's going to take some time yet. During this time, let it not be wasted. Let us ask, what are you doing? What are you wanting to do? And then join you in your work. And we'll be careful to give you the praise in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for that message, Reverend Lloyd. And now our closing hymn this morning is My Jesus, I Love Thee.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.